Well, in the middle of an, a normal uh, routine kind of week in the garage, I was called into my boss's office and he asked me two questions. The first one was, can you swim? And I said, yes, I can swim. He said, have you ever had any experience with boats? And I said, well, uh, my experience is a bit limited to just a rowing on the pond, you know. And he said, look, we've, got a, we've had a request from the Asian office for practical people to take part in a project that they're running. And uh, I can't really tell you the details of it, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back to, I was in Holland at the time, I want you to go back to Britain. Go to the Philippine Embassy in, in London and get yourself a long-term visitor's visa. And here's a list of the shots that you need to get before you leave. Because you're flying out of um, Schiphol Airport on Tuesday morning uh, on a flight to the Philippines, to Manila. Oh, now this was, this, this was kind of characteristic open doors behavior. Um, you know, your life would go on uh, in the, the even tenor of its way and suddenly someone would uh, announce you were going off to some other remote part of the world to do something. Normally you were told really what it was, but in this particular case we weren't told. Um, we, we landed in Manila and it's a bit like a James Bond story actually. Um, the instruction was to book into the, the Philippine Village Hotel at the airport. and. After three days, you will receive a phone call. <laughs> uh, that was the only instruction that we had. So the, the phone call came and they said, tomorrow morning we'll pick you up. So we were picked up and we were taken in the car. For four hours we drove the car, nobody told us anything about what was going on. We just sat in the back of the car and we ended up at the ferry port. We got on a ferry boat and we ended up on a beautiful tropical island in the Philippines called Mindoro, Mindoro Island. And there, um, a certain Captain Bill Tinsley had his base. He said, um, I'm going to tell you now what the project is about, but I asked them in Holland to make sure you had return tickets in your pocket. So if there's anything about this that you don't feel sure about, or it worries you in some way, you're under no obligation whatsoever to participate. And he said, here's what we're going to do. We've received a request from the house church movement in China, and they have assessed their needs and come to the conclusion that they, they currently need, and quite urgently need, one million Bibles. He said, I've worked it out, a million Bibles is 232 tons. This is communist China we're talking about, where the church is persecuted and forbidden, and people meet in secret, and they have no access to Bibles, and their pastors are put in jail. And this is the kind of context in which we have to take this vast quantity. I mean, think of a tennis court about six foot deep in boxes. That's what a million Bibles looks like. And he himself was uh, an old seaman and he naturally his thoughts turned to a ship. The more he thought about it, he came to the conclusion that we would have to design a special ship in order to do what we wanted to do. Paper is lighter than water. So if you were to wrap a box of Bibles, completely waterproof wrap them, they will float in water. So his idea was to float them from the, from the water onto the beach using the last of the high tide. The practicalities was how do you get um, all of those boxes from the ship into the water? And what he came up with was a ship which would actually sink. If you piled all of these boxes, there's 232 tons of material on the deck of a barge. Um, 
They can be craned on at the point of embarkation. The difficulty was getting them off on this remote beach in China with, you know, naval radar and patrol boats and coast guards and all kinds of security stuff going on. How do we deliver these under the noses of all of this security quietly and effectively? So if you can imagine a tugboat crossing the ocean, towing a barge full of Bibles, and as we get in towards the beach, we open these big valves, huge valves, 10 inch valves, and the water begin, begins to rush in and floods this chamber underneath the deck. The deck sinks, yeah? The doors uh, on winches slowly open. The thing continues to sink. The water floods over the deck, it rises higher and higher, until finally these bales are buoyant. They're beginning to float a wee bit. And as soon as they begin to float, because they're six feet high and only two feet wide, they topple over and lie flat. The plan was to train teams of guys with Zodiac rubber boats. Now a Zodiac is a rim, a rigid inflatable boat. <clears throat> it's got a solid bottom, but it's got rubber um, cushions all the way around. Um, and we adapted these as small tugs. And the idea was that we would tow these floating packages in a string of about three or maybe four together. So we've got 232 of these and we've got two teams of Z-boats. Um, so so um, this is the plan, okay, this is the plan. This, this is just a blueprint on paper at the moment. My friend Cor and I are both quite technical and we get this and we're really, really excited about this. It's, we, we, we kind of see that this is really creative and really original and it might even work, you know. But at this point, we have very little money. We certainly have no barge, no tugboat. We have an idea, yeah. And we're, we're in at the beginning. And so he's saying to us, if you don't like it, you can, you've got your plane ticket, you can go back home and, and no questions asked. And we said, what? we love it. This is great. <laughs> what a great idea. So one or two other people in the in the Manila office of Open Doors were in on it. The vast majority of the staff knew nothing about what was going on at all. This thing was just really, really a well-kept secret. During that time, the captain was kind of looking for potential crew members. But these the men thing. were all administrators or fundraisers or, you know, the 20 crew members. They, they, they trawled through the Open Doors offices all over the world to find people who could sort of take part in this project. But none of them were seamen, or in the least bit kind of, you know, suitable. So while we were, we, while we were busy uh, with hardware and printing Bibles and getting ships ready and so on and so forth, the Chinese church on the inside were preparing to distribute the Bibles. Um, theirs was the bigger job, possibly. And so what they decided to do was to arrange a youth conference in that, in that part of the country. And uh, that was scheduled for March the 18th. But they, there were some holdups. Uh, the barge was behind schedule that actually at the very last minute, we, no, we couldn't, get a message, we couldn't get a message through. And so they were all there, but we didn't show up. And so... The next confluence of high tide and full moon was on June the 18th and we were quite determined that nothing would stop us from um, making that date. But sadly that takes us into what they call uh, the typhoon season. Typhoons are unpredictable, they can just show up and, and you really, and the only thing to do is to, to wait them out. So we're all up in the bridge having a prayer meeting and deciding the captain is very, very reluctant to impose his will on the group. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's the only democratic crew ever in the history of the maritime, you know. It, it just doesn't happen. The captain's word is final and all you do is do what you're told. It's quite remarkable that he deferred to the, the faith of the group 
Fortunately, we all agreed that typhoon or no typhoon, we were going to give it our best shot. 